Um, okay, uh, Friday, our last class together, um, we will have two presentations on uh, Renaissance, well, mainly kind of writing and philosophy and, and <laughs> literature and so on. It's not the plague, is it? <laughs> uh, you know, during the presentation, I was doing, you know, like you always get paranoid about things. Um, are you okay? Have some water or something, Maria, please. To, um, I'll just stand over here. Uh, I've even forgotten what I was saying now. What was I saying? What was I talking about? It's probably not very important, was it? Hmm? Yeah, we're having the two presentations as long as Maria is still with us. And uh, so I will introduce, I will have some general thoughts about the Renaissance now. Uh, many of you have some idea about the Renaissance, either from uh, general knowledge or because you've actually done a paper for me on the subject. So uh, I'll try and remember to ask a few questions and, and elicit some suggestions and so on as we go along. But I'll just cover some very, very general ground. And please put your hand up if I haven't asked for some contribution for a while, if you want to add anything or something like that. Um, and I will use visual material primarily to, uh, to try and make a few uh, general and specific points. Uh, so this is this list of, of uh, websites here. So, the Renaissance, the Renaissance, as opposed to the Carolingian Renaissance, or the 12th century Renaissance, or the uh, Ottonian Renaissance, but the Renaissance, uh, we associate with um, initially Italy, the 14th 15th centuries, and then moving perhaps northwards into other parts of Europe, sometimes called the Northern Renaissance, into 15th and 16th centuries. And many of the things moving over perhaps um, in Italy as well, into the 16th century as well. So very roughly what I would call the end of the uh, Middle Ages and the beginning of the modern period, straddling 1500 there. And that's why the essay question which I, I have on the list is, is the Renaissance, does it mark the culmination, the end of, uh, of the medieval period, or does it look forward to something different and uh, new? Like all historical concepts, uh, it is a construct. It is an artificial thing which exists in our understanding and what we think and we understand in a very general way may well not have been what an individual man in Florence in the 15th century actually thought was going on around him, for example. So we have to be aware uh, of the, the nature. Uh, the more we generalize, then a sense the, the, the further we get away from, to some extent, reality. But categorizing things and generalizing is obviously what historians do. Otherwise, we're just talking about things floating uh, in a kind of vacuum. So we need things like the Renaissance, not just to periodize uh, things, but as a way of understanding the nature uh, of, a, of a time. The Renaissance that we're talking about here, we see as an intellectual and, we could say, artistic movement or series of movements, uh, okay, uh, which are characterized by a number of perhaps different features. And we'll, have a, we'll, we'll talk very generally uh, in this class about these uh, features. As usual, however, it's often useful, if we want to understand a concept, uh, firstly, to look at the word itself, okay, because that at least gives us some idea of what, uh, what it's supposed to mean or what it did mean at one time, even if the word has changed. So, a simple question, what does renaissance, renaissance, what does it mean? Rebirth. Rebirth, Rebirth okay. And not in the kind of sense that, I don't know, some religious movement, some religions believe in reincarnation or something like that, but, uh, uh, but maybe not too far different. We have the prefix re, which means coming again. Something is done again. Something is repeated, for example. In this case, born again. So in that sense, the Renaissance is looking back at something else and uh, saying it's come back, it's returned, it's born again or something. So it's not actually necessarily something which is new. 
it's something which is old but is being cast uh, in a new way, in a new context, something like that. Okay? So that's a very important point, because if we're thinking of Renaissance as somehow something uh, modern and uh, new, then we're using the wrong word, because Renaissance, if that's the correct term, implies something which is being uh, uh, re-established or found again from the past. So what, in this sense, and there are other ways of defining the Renaissance that we'll come across in a minute, what, in this sense, is the thing or things which is being reborn? What was the thing that was being rediscovered or found again or looked at again? What is the, the old thing? Classic culture, but did you read classic culture? Well, maybe Roman in the sense, but a bit of, but yes. Classical antiquity, uh, the culture, um, the ideas, the language uh, of, the, uh, of the ancient world, uh, the Greeks, and I would say perhaps even more important, the Romans in a sense. Okay. Remember, we are in Italy, and we'll come back to that point in a minute, okay? But, uh, uh, but then Roman culture was derived from, was based upon Greek culture, so we're not going to be splitting hairs over this one in a sense. But classical culture, Greek and Roman culture, okay, which uh, in an intellectual and to some extent artistic sense uh, is seen as being uh, uh, re-established. It was during, in Italy, during the Renaissance, that in a way I got my job, because it was the Middle Ages were invented as a concept during the Renaissance, okay? We have people like Petrarch or, or Boccaccio and all the people that we're going to be hearing about uh, on Friday in detail, thinking that they are in somehow uh, very cultured and clever and wanting to distance themselves from the uh, culture of uh, contemporary and recent Northern Europe, in a sense, which we would call the late Middle Ages, okay? And they looked back to their own heritage, that's why I stress Rome again, to uh, ancient Italy under the Romans, uh, and they said that's what we want to be like. Okay? Somehow, after the decline of the Roman Empire, after the fall of the Roman Empire, things became dark. The concept of the Dark Ages, uh, which again we, we're very familiar with today, was kind of invented then. So, we have us, and we have our great Roman forefathers and ancestors and so on. And then we have the bit in between, the bit in the middle. Okay? And that's where the idea of uh, medium Ivon, the Middle Age, comes from. Okay? It's the bit in between us and the Romans, in a sense. So this is important for us both in the sense of the Renaissance, but also, as I said, in the sense of developing the concept of the, the Middle Ages, which again is a construct, okay? Uh, and we've been looking at that construct for the past 15 weeks together. This idea was, to some extent, taken up and reinforced by scholars uh, later on. Uh, in the 19th century, a number of writers, but perhaps uh, most famously, uh, I can't remember if we have to put a C in there or not. Bur Jakob Burkhardt, uh, which actually we have his book here. And Maria has been consulting his book there. And uh, yes, we do in fact have a C there before the K. Um, he, perhaps more than anyone else, is kind of the father of uh, the modern idea of the Renaissance. He invented that concept in a way, or, or at least kind of brought it all together uh, in his writings. Uh, and obviously, as someone from Europe in the 19th century, he was a great believer, for example, in progress. That was one of the big concepts of uh, late 18th and 19th century, that the U Europeans in particular are the ones who are leading the progress in the world. And so, this affects the way he sees the past. Okay? We have a progression, we have a, an improvement. The Middle Ages is something, to some extent, culturally, intellectually negative or whatever, and the Renaissance marks the progression, the move forward. So this idea of seeing the Renaissance as a sort of modernizing and positive thing compared to what was going on before uh, is partly a result of what people in Italy at that time were, were kind of doing, but also a product of kind of 19th century positivist uh, uh, scholarship in that way as well. So um, it's not to say that we can't talk about the Renaissance. 
and uh, I wonder in advance, you may even talk about the Renaissance again next semester with my colleague Caddock, and he will probably say some very, very different things, a different perspective. He'll probably even say it doesn't exist or something. He tends to do that. But, um, um, uh, which makes a very quick class. Okay, thank you very much. We'll go away now. But, uh, he, uh, but obviously, you know, for historians, we need to think about these things. We need to think about what, what we understand by them uh, ourselves as well. Um, why Italy? Well, anyone got any ideas? Why, why the Renaissance at least began, took its origin in Italy? Ravel? Um, because it was um, divided into smaller Italian states, it was um, able to create more of a merchant economy faster mm -hmm. than other states, which led to the financing of like artistic works, and then also led to the widening of political discourse at the time, because rich merchant class could develop. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, yeah, we've got political and kind of socio-economic factors are often given. The development of these focused, but still quite Im large, in some cases, powerful city-states, and some of them more important for the Renaissance than others, of course, as we shall maybe mention later on. Uh, so we have a sort of society with these mercantile oligarchs, uh, who've got lots of money and in a sense say, well, what am I going to do with that? How am I going to spend this money conspicuously so people can see that I am somehow a, a big guy and patronizing, patronizing the arts, helping artists and so on, uh, <coughs> but getting some benefit from that was, was obviously one of the things that they chose to do. And so it's not you as well as spreading. Let's go. <laughs> Definitely. Um, Selma, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, you, you put your hand up. I, I chose Ravel, but I... Yes, so, so yes, socially, economically, politically, uh, it doesn't have to be, but there is a good context for this uh, new way of thinking, if that's what we want to call it, but we have to challenge that word new anyway. So, can? Okay. Turks started the <laughs> After the fall of, well, the conquest of Constantinople. When did Constantinople fall to the Ottomans? <laughs> Old, yeah, okay. <laughs> Italians had been doing renaissance -y things for over a hundred years by that point. Uh, some Greeks had been leaving earlier on. They, they could see what was going to happen, I suppose, and been bringing all the stuff over. But yeah, we talked about this before. The, uh, the indirect contribution of the Turks, it's all the Turks' fault. If they hadn't conquered Constantinople, then there would not have been a, a renaissance and so on. Obviously, again, something for us to debate. It, uh, uh, the arrival of, of Greeks at very various points from uh, uh, the East, uh, bringing with them classical uh, authors and in the original, uh, some of them, the texts which the people in the West hadn't had, played one part, a contribution to it all, but uh, uh, many other factors putting together in a sense are important. Italy again, important physically because, as I said, if the Renaissance is seen primarily as this rebirth of classical culture, then uh, you know, the, where do you see classical um, Roman architecture uh, and good examples of Roman sculpture more? Well, a lot of it existed uh, in Italy, okay, in Rome and, and in other parts of, of Italy. So physically, uh, what they were hoping to, to copy uh, existed around them a lot more there than it did in northern Scotland, for example. You're not going to get uh, the Renaissance beginning in Scotland if, if we define it in these terms. And again, going back to these people that Selma and Ravel were mentioning, these uh, wealthy um, uh, mercantile uh, groups that were controlling, dominating the city-states, okay, they came to see themselves not just physically as successors of the Romans in Italy, but kind of emotionally they connected themselves with, with the great Roman republics, uh, the, the Roman Republic and, and elsewhere. And so they, they began to see themselves as kind of patricians and, and successors of Rome and so on. And so again, uh, the focus of the Renaissance uh, from politics to uh, culture connected there to, uh, to, the, to Rome in a way. So we have a number of, uh, of, of possible reasons on a, on a whole uh, host of, uh, of levels. Let me uh, skip over that. Um, we must be careful, however, 
as I said before, Renaissance spreading, we do find uh, important developments in Northern Europe, to some extent not just copying uh, what was going on in Italy, but having their own uh, contribution as well. So uh, in the broader sense, the Renaissance, we can talk about the Italian Renaissance or the, the broader Renaissance, uh, what, what people were doing in, uh, in uh, France or, or uh, Holland, uh, or um, the Netherlands or, or England was kind of similar but also a bit different. So we can't just say it's all because of the Italians. There was a, a general thing that was going on. Now, um, I'll say a few things now which will kind of vaguely anticipate a little bit of what we're going to hear on um, uh, Friday, but I'll try and keep away uh, from those uh, in some ways. Um, and make a point which uh, I think I may have made at the start of the semester, I can't remember, we have to look at the video to see. Uh, but very often when people in Italy during the uh, 14th or 15th centuries tried to do this and reach back to the Romans, very often what they ended up doing was kind of doing that. Okay, So they, they missed out what had been going on for the past couple of hundred years uh, in uh, Europe, Northern Europe, and they ended up copying things or taking things which existed in the 11th or 12th centuries. Okay, they were, that, that became their models. My favorite example of that is from paleography. So let us have a look here. All right, here is a very typical um, late medieval uh, Northern European, probably from France, I'm not so sure, but uh, yeah, it's written in French, isn't it? Um, uh, example of what we call gath Gothic uh, black letter, okay, script. Um, and it's the kind of one that ends up as the font for kind of doing medieval things. It's probably even on the syllabus I used a similar one, okay. Uh, and it's, uh, it's described as Gothic. Uh, as a kind of script, that's quite an important phrase, we'll come across that again. And this was exactly the kind of thing which men in Italy during the um, 14th and especially in the 15th century were, were trying to avoid. They didn't like this. Okay? This was for them the Middle Ages, the middle bit that they, they kind of didn't like. So these individuals, we're going to go with this today, came up with an alternative script digging around in manuscripts, uh, which we call humanistic script, okay, various kinds. This is their book hand, their formal hand, okay, uh, and it's the ancestor of our handwriting in English and Turkish uh, today. The Times, New Roman, whatever is, is based upon, upon this. And humanism, obviously, part, uh, we'll talk about humanism more on Friday, I think, so I won't say much about that today, but humanism, humanistic script, it means Renaissance handwriting, okay. Now the irony is that the humanistic script um, used here towards the end of the 15th century you can see in Italy uh, was not based upon uh, a Roman uh, handwriting at all. It was based upon Caroline Minuscule, which was the big uh, one of the big products of the Carolingian Renaissance, okay, maybe uh, under the uh, at least encouragement of Charlemagne and his English uh, um, friend Alcuin or whatever, the, the, exactly the origins of it are, are debated, but uh, I mentioned to you many, many weeks ago how in the early part of the uh, uh, Carolingian period, uh, different monasteries had very, very different scripts and hands, often very nasty ones, and then gradually this became the standard that everyone used from the royal court, but also in various monasteries and so on. And a lot of uh, classical, uh, relatively anyway, a lot of classical uh, writings were preserved by the Carolingians in versions of this uh, carrying on. Uh, so we're talking about uh, 8th, 9th, uh, 10th centuries and so on. Okay. So that's a definite case of the humanistic script being an earlier medieval uh, form of handwriting. Uh, they didn't use, um, okay, this is called rustic capitals. This is an example of, uh, of Roman handwriting, but they didn't use a proper, correct Roman uh, uh, scripts. They used a, an earlier medieval script as the basis for what they were uh, trying to do. 
Okay, let's look at architecture now and look at two. Oh, all right. All right, two examples of Gothic architecture. Um, this one, not a great one. The outside here, I'm concerned about big churches, cathedrals, and so on. Okay, the Gothic church is very famous for their tall spires reaching up to God, obviously, and so on. And the interior of them, and if that's very clear uh, to you, you have uh, what we call pointed arches and window frames, so coming like that, for example, and similar pattern, what we call vaulted roofs there, with this kind of pattern. Okay, And that was the typical uh, system of designing big churches in the later Middle Ages in Northern Europe. And again, we call that Gothic architecture, a bit like we call that handwriting Gothic. And that's exactly the kind of thing that these refined men in Italy didn't want. They didn't want these kinds of churches. What they came up with as an alternative is the following. Let's have a look at three. I think we've got three here. This is all... Um, these are all uh, connected in one way or another with the architect and artist uh, Brunelleschi. Um, and I think all the examples are going to show are actually in Florence. This uh, cathedral um, was started earlier, uh, before his time, but he was involved particularly, I think, in uh, designing and building this dome. We see in Italy in the Renaissance uh, many more churches uh, often having domes rather than spires, uh, and often churches are even designed in this big round shape, a bit like ancient Greek churches than what are now mosques in, in Turkey and so on. So uh, uh, a different uh, appearance there uh, than the Gothic ones. Uh, this is the Hospital of the Innocents in uh, Florence, and I give this as, uh, again, connected to the same guy, but here we don't see the pointed arches, we see round arches, which you might think, what's the big deal of that? Um, but it's quite important, and I think we'll see the same in this interior uh, of a church. Okay, and again, we see uh, flat roofs rather than vaulted, and we see the arches, uh, quite popular. This, again, is a kind of an example of that. Uh, and the patterns here are from, again, 11th, 12th century uh, European uh, architectural trends called Romanesque, which are seen to be kind of like the Romans, and they are using and uh, uh, rediscovering uh, Greek and Roman uh, uh, architectural patterns, but in terms of designing churches, okay, uh, these examples were quite important. So I think this could arguably at least partly be another example of, of a kind of earlier medieval as opposed to the Gothic. It's the Gothic that they're, they are reacting to, that they're trying to avoid. <clears throat> okay, so that for me is all the stuff to do with Rome and so on. Okay, rebirth, and I would say, well, sort of, okay, because there's a lot more going on, as we can see. Let's look at a few different things now. In art, here is a late medieval painting, quite a nice painting compared to a, a miniature, I think we should call it, from the middle of the 15th century. And when you look at that, what do you think? And what, uh, it's quite colourful and so on, but what, uh, what do you notice uh, as a modern uh, uh, connoisseur of art? What things do you notice in this picture? And this is a relatively late example. Crane. Sorry? Isn't there a crane in the back? Some kind of device for lifting the, or they're obviously building that church or whatever it is, I suppose. I'm not sure what the painting is, I didn't look. But, uh, the perspective is really awkward because the what? building is about as, the size of the man. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, uh, you've got these little guys at the top here uh, because they're meant to be far and high up, 
You've got this guy who seems a lot taller than him, and these men here, and these little ones over here. The building in relation to the people, it's all a bit odd. The perspective, from our perspective, is completely wrong, in a sense. Okay? Uh, if, you, if it was the sort of child's art class or something in high school, you'd say, well, your perspective isn't very good, is it? Just draw, drawing the people small doesn't make it, uh, doesn't give it the right perspective. But he's trying to achieve something. Uh, and this is quite a late example as well, so it's quite, I mean, there is an attempt with perspective here in the distance and so on. If we saw uh, an earlier uh, 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 painting or, or an illustration in a Bible or something from the early Middle Ages, we'd, we'd have even more problems with that. And you see the art in the Middle Ages was, was often called kind of very flat and lacking in kind of proper perspective. And so it's not really very realistic, it's not very really connected to what the, the real world is like. Okay. What Renaissance artists did was what? They worked more realistically, like they studied human bodies and they painted uh, realistic uh, paints. Yes, they tried to be more realistic, they tried to be more naturalistic yes. as well, that's another word. Uh, uh, We'll, we'll come across some examples of these. And the perspective is one big issue in this, okay, to, to represent what you see more uh, effectively and so on. But then the detail of things uh, is also important. So if we close this one, um, and okay, we, here we have, uh, so I've it here now, quite an early uh, example, and so we're kind of moving on a little bit. Um, but this is uh, Giotto di Bondone, uh, who was from the very early, I think, 14th century uh, Italian artist. Um, he's beginning, but in a very, uh, still for me, kind of medieval way, uh, apparently he's, he begins to try and, and represent uh, uh, things and his art, this, isn't, this is only one example, is, is seen in that way. But uh, more importantly, when we go to the later uh, art, and here's perhaps one of the most famous examples, we're not showing Da Vinci or um, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, anyone else, but for me, I think the most uh, best example is is Raphael's The School of Athens, which is what we have here, because it's a great example of of perspective, taking you in, uh, centering you into the picture, uh, and so on, with the, the the vault up here, and then the various levels of people and the. Uh, and, and carrying on in the back there and so on. Of course, nice rounded arches and so on in a, in a, in a nice classical or Romanesque way, whatever you want. And, uh, and obviously, uh, the human bodies, the figures, a lot more realistic. Uh, and the distance between people at the front, you feel it's like a photograph or something like that. Okay, so uh, this is something which the Romans didn't have. Roman painting was very similar uh, to the kind of things that people were doing in the early and central Middle Ages. Okay, so here we're not talking about uh, leaping back and reviving the great uh, painting traditions of the Romans. This is something new. Okay, so previously we're looking at reviving things that were older, um, whether Roman or otherwise. Here we're definitely talking about new developments. Okay, but even looking there at that very late medieval. Um, Northern European painting with the little men and so on, they're trying, it's just they're failing to do it. Okay, Little men on top is meant to be far away and high up and so on, uh, whereas it's achieved fully uh, in something like this. Okay, um, quickly moving on to a very famous um, painting, uh, Jan van I don't wish I pronounce it correctly. I think the surname is spelt in various ways. Who was a, uh, this is from um, 15th century, so around about 1430, I'm not sure exactly of the date, okay. Um, very few have seen this picture before, I presume. Elif? Yeah, we'll come to that in a minute, okay? Um, this is a, uh, an example of art in the um, northern Europe, fairly early, from the, he was working in the beginning of the uh, 15th century. Um, 
it's not quite as uh, uh, it's not quite like Raphael or Michelangelo I mean, in terms of its uh, its kind of representation of the human form. Uh, here, in particular, uh, we are see what what are we what what is what are these northern artists in the Netherlands, especially? What are they trying to achieve? What's he doing here? Okay, realism in kind of detail is how it's often said. So this painting often we focus in on parts of it. I mean, I don't know the the folds in her dress and so on and things like that. If I remember correctly, this guy actually was an Italian merchant or something. So there's a connection there. Ironically enough, he chose to do a painting of a of an Italian guy living somewhere in a, uh, in in a Holland or, or whatever it was. But as Elif said, um, it's famous for. Uh, the little reflection in the mirror at the back where you see the back of the, uh, of the characters and probably it's the artist or someone uh, over there and so on. So again, this realism isn't always in the kind of perspective but it's in the little details uh, trying to pick up really what things uh, were like in a way as well. But this is an example from uh, Northern Europe rather than Italy but there's an Italian connection as we said. And lastly, Sculpture. Now, a little bit different here. Let's just look at these two images. This is uh, from a uh, 13th century medieval church somewhere. I don't know exactly where. Okay. Um, some religious figures or whoever they might be uh, carved into the side of what was probably a, a, a gothic y kind of a church or something. And this is um, sculpture by Donatello of a, um, a kind of uh, a successful oligarch cum dictator in Padua, I think, and I've forgotten his name now, but uh, who wanted to have himself represented, in a sense, like a, a great Roman general or something like that. Now. Any comments? Anything worth saying here? In this case, of course, I mean, Romans, Greeks, and especially the Romans, were very good at uh, sculpture. Uh, very fine examples of, uh, of those that do survive, often with the heads missing and things like that. Uh, you want to make any comparisons between the medieval one from the 13th century and uh, Donatello uh, about 200 years later? I mean, the, the people who commissioned the different um, works of art are pretty significant. Like, um, you have the church buying this one, and the Roman patron buying the other. I mean, that's pretty significant. Right, okay, this, this is a, a secular uh, commission. Uh, and again, these are these, uh, as we said, the rich uh, merchant class who are patronizing the arts in many cases. Um, the church isn't out of the picture completely in the Renaissance by any means. I mean, the greatest examples of, of painting uh, are in the Vatican. The, the School of Athens is in the Vatican, of course, and later on with Michelangelo and so on. So the church uh, continued to be a very important patron of the arts during the Renaissance period. So, um, but the, the, the picture has broadened, perhaps you might say, in a way here, in that sense. Um, compared to the painting, I mean, this isn't so bad, is it really? I mean, it's a fairly nice kind of thing. Is it diff how is it different? Are there any differences? This is not from the This is, yeah, this is from 13th century Northern Europe somewhere, from a Gothic church somewhere in Northern Europe. So I'm just contrasting them there. And I'm not, I don't even know what the answer is, but I mean, you've got very bad sculpture from the Middle Ages, but you've also got some very good sculpture adorning churches from the late Middle Ages as well. Didn't they have a really hard time making, uh, in the Middle Ages and in the Roman period even, making any figures that were doing anything other than just kind of standing straight? Mm -hmm. Like in like a, almost, a, almost a, like a very straight military type pose? It, yeah, probably the, the techniques they had and then therefore what they could achieve uh, were very different. So yes, the, you don't usually see people with their arms up in the air because the arm would probably fall off. It's all sort of stuck there and it's carved out of the, uh, out of the stone or whatever it might be. Whereas uh, the techniques used by uh, 
uh, Donatello and, and others uh, very different, okay, casting things in, in stone or whatever, and they, what they can achieve was a lot more realistic in a way as well. So it's a technical thing there, I suspect. So for each of these categories that we've been looking at, okay, we see different things. We see the desire to revive uh, Roman things, which was going on. They wanted to write better Latin uh, and be, uh, and rather than the, the debased, corrupt Latin of the Middle Ages, they wanted to be able to write the Latin of Caesar and Cicero and so on. They also wanted to reach back to the Romans in other ways, but they ended up in the Middle Ages, as I've been arguing. Okay, um, so this is backward-looking thing. Uh, there are new developments, as we saw in painting, but a kind of gradual thing, building up on what people were beginning more and more to, to do, but the breakthrough with realism, naturalism, perspective, uh, okay, changing things a lot. This is something new. This is not uh, a re renaissance. This is, in a way, something new. But in the sphere of, of for example, uh, sculpture, okay, we can see uh, Roman samples, but we can see a kind of maybe a development through the Middle Ages as techniques were, were slowly getting better as well. So we can see a, a number of things there. Was it you who said that um, the Renaissance kind of killed the development of Latin and like made it a dead language? Because I heard somewhere that um, it, was, uh, it was developing, it was still like developing and accumulating more words before the Renaissance, but then during the Renaissance you had this desire to kind of like preserve it in its classical form. And then you had like the, the, the usage of um, vernacular languages increasing. Okay, well that's yeah something we're going to be talking about on Friday a little bit more, so I've kept away from that. But yes, somewhat ironically enough, whereas on the one hand, uh, Renaissance scholars in Italy wanted to uh, revive Latin uh, and uh, have correct good Latin uh, in a classical sense, on the other hand, we also, when we talk about literature in the Renaissance, this is what Maria is going to be talking about, so I don't want to say too much, we do have the emergence more and more of vernacular literatures in a way that we had been seeing very slowly in many parts of the Middle Ages, some places more than, than others. Uh, so these two things are both parallel but in theory kind of opposing because now it's kind of living literature can be done in your own language Okay, including during the later Middle Ages, we see the translation of the Bible more and more into, uh, into vernacular so that you can preach directly to people. So you, you get communication in a literary way through vernaculars more and more. On the other hand, uh, you're supposed to be getting good Latin. So you, that's, it could be argued that uh, these two movements in parallel, whether it's the Renaissance or just they happen to be happening at that time, uh, kind of uh, solidified Latin uh, in a way. Um, in the Middle Ages, of course, Latin was not just a, a written language, but in many parts of the church, they spoke and communicated with each other in, in forms of Latin. But the Latin that they used in, in England was a little bit different from the Latin that was used in Spain uh, and so on and things like that. So, uh, yes, there's something to be said for that, I think. Any other comments? Any other points here? Okay, let's finish there then for today. Thank you very much again, Bora, for your presentation. Friday? Uh, we will have uh, two presentations. I, I've tried to keep away from the literature and, and the writing side because I want to, us to focus on those together on Friday. And if I remember, uh, and if I have time, we may have two minutes of the guitar. If I, I'll have to make sure it's in tune and things like that. Okay, um, see you all on Friday. Um, okay, uh, Friday, our last class together, um, we will have two presentations on uh, Renaissance, well, mainly kind of writing and philosophy and, and literature and so on. It's not the plague, is it? <laughs> uh, you know, during the presentation, I was doing, you know, like you always get paranoid about things. Um, are you okay? Have some water or something, Maria, please. To, um, I'll just stand over here. Uh, I've even forgotten what I was saying now. What was I saying? What was I talking about? It's probably not very important, was it? Hmm? Yeah, we're having the two presentations as long as Maria is still with us. And uh, so I will introduce, I will have some general thoughts about the Renaissance now. Uh, many of you have some idea about the Renaissance, either from 
uh, general knowledge or because you've actually done a paper for me on the subject. So uh, I'll try and remember to ask a few questions and, and elicit some suggestions and so on as we go along. But I'll just cover some very, very general ground. And please put your hand up if I haven't asked for some contribution for a while and uh, uh, re-established or found again from the past. So what, in this sense, and there are other ways of defining the Renaissance that we'll come across in a minute, what, in this sense, is the thing or things which is being reborn? What was the thing that was being rediscovered or found again or looked at again? What is the, the old thing? Classic culture, but particularly Greek. Well, maybe Roman, in the sense, but a bit of, but yes, classical antiquity, uh, the culture, um, the ideas, the language uh, of, the, uh, of the ancient world, uh, the Greeks, and I would say perhaps even more important, the Romans in a sense. Okay. Remember we are in Italy and we'll come back to that point in a minute. Okay. But, uh, uh, but then Roman culture was derived from, was based upon Greek culture, so we're not going to be splitting hairs over this one in a sense. But classical culture, Greek and Roman culture, okay, which uh, in an intellectual and to some extent artistic sense uh, is seen as being uh, uh, re-established. It was during in Italy during the Renaissance that, in a way, I got my job because it was the Middle Ages were invented as a concept during the Renaissance. Okay? We have people like Petrarch, if you want to add anything, or something like that. Um, and I will use visual material primarily to, uh, to try and make a few uh, general and specific points. Uh, so this is this list of, of uh, websites here. So, the Renaissance, the Renaissance, as opposed to the Carolingian Renaissance, or the 12th century Renaissance, or the uh, Ottonian Renaissance, but the Renaissance, uh, we associate with um, initially Italy, the 14th, 15th centuries, and then moving perhaps northwards into other parts of Europe, sometimes called the Northern Renaissance, into 15th and 16th centuries. And many of the things moving over perhaps um, in Italy as well, into the 16th century as well. So very roughly what I would call the end of the uh, Middle Ages and the beginning of the modern period, straddling 1500 there. And that's why the essay question which I, I have on the list is, is the Renaissance, does it mark the culmination, the end of, uh, of the medieval period, or does it look, okay, because that at least gives us some idea of what, uh, what it's supposed to mean or what it did mean at one time, even if the word has changed. So a simple question, what does Renaissance, Renaissance, what does it mean? Rebirth. Rebirth, okay, and not in the kind of sense that, I don't know, some religious movement, some religions believe in reincarnation or something like that, but, uh, uh, but maybe not too far different. We have the prefix re, which means coming again, something is done again, something is repeated, for example, in this case, born again. So, in that sense, the Renaissance is looking back at something else and uh, saying it's come back, it's returned, it's born again or something. So it's not actually necessarily something which is new. It's something which is old but is being cast uh, in a new way, in a new context, something like that. Okay? So that's a very important point because if we're thinking of Renaissance as somehow something uh, modern, and uh, new, then we're using the wrong word, because Renaissance, if that's the correct term, implies something which is being forward to something different and uh, new. Like all historical concepts, uh, it is a construct. It is an artificial thing which exists in our understanding. And what we think and we understand in a very general way may well not have been what an individual man in Florence 
in the 15th century actually thought was going on around him, for example. So we have to be aware uh, of the, the nature. Uh, the more we generalize, then a sense the, the, the further we get away from, to some extent, reality. But categorizing things and generalizing is obviously what historians do. Otherwise, we're just talking about things floating uh, in a kind of vacuum. So we need things like the Renaissance, not just to periodize uh, things, but as a way of understanding the nature uh, of, a, of a time. The Renaissance that we're talking about here, we see as an intellectual and, we could say, artistic movement or series of movements, uh, okay, uh, which are characterized by a number of perhaps different features. And we'll, have a, we'll, we'll talk very generally uh, in this class about these uh, features. As usual, however, it's often useful, if we want to understand a concept, uh, firstly, to look at the word itself.